Well, finally, some good news to share with you here on the show. At least Europe seems to be waking up. Maybe. Fingers crossed. This weekend, Portugal said no to socialists in their most recent election. The UK just banned the use of puberty blockers for kids. Huge victory. And Ireland just shocked the world with a majority of Irish voters saying hell no and rejected the government's plan to change the definition of family. That we're about to do that. I'm feeling pretty good about all of this right now. David Thunder is an Irish researcher, lecturer in political philosophy, and he's been covering this vote, this government vote, uh, on his Substack. David, welcome back to the show. Good to see you. Thanks, Clayton. Good to see you. Good to be here. Yeah, and hopefully this is some good news. The rejection of this seems like a big deal. We'll get into that and how it was rejected in a second. But before we get into the vote on this, can you explain to our audience what the government was trying to do here with this redefinition of the family? Yeah, there were two amendments that they were trying to push through to our constitution. One of them, which was, I would say, uh, very controversial, was to basically change the definition of the family, which previously had been defined as a unit based on marriage, right? A social unit that came out of a marriage. Um, and uh, they wanted to change that to a social unit that was based on a durable relationship, right? So uh, durable relationships were to become the basis for marriage, um, and nobody quite knew what a durable relationship entails. Um, it was in a highly ambiguous and open-ended concept, and it gave rise to a lot of concerns. Um, and the second amendment was, was uh, what they called the CARE Amendment, which the Constitution recognizes the uh, critical role of mothers and their contribution to the common good because of the work, the caring work they do in the home. Um, but this particular amendment wanted to remove the, the reference to mothers and just make it more gender neutral and kind of say, well, the Constitution recognizes the role of caregivers in the family, but they basically took out the word mother and replaced it with members of the family. So the, the so-called care amendment, and as you described it, as a, basically just a piece of window dressing. So uh, and it's, so they're going to remove, fa and also remove fathers too, right? Was there a mention of fathers in this? No. I mean, the interesting thing is that they sold it as being a more inclusive approach to care um, and less kind of, uh, you know, more inclusive and, and more respectful because, you know, it was all the members of the family and not just the mother. But actually what they ended up doing was they took out mother where they could have said mothers and fathers. But instead of that, they just said members of the family. Um, and I would assume that this is partly because they want to, you know, bring in the idea that carers can be transgender, can be mothers, can be fathers, can be, you know, that uh, they don't want a biologically defined account of parenting. I would say that's one of the things that's driving this particular uh, amendment. Forgetting the research around the importance of family and what it does to children, the raising of children, how important it is, right? We know in the absence of having a father in the family how detrimental it is to a family, right? Forget, forget the research for a moment on that. But the, this family amendment, as you write, if it would have passed, it would have had all sorts of uh, financial and, um, and regulatory concerns for like inheriting property, like if I'm just a, you know, if I'm just the boyfriend of somebody and someone passes away, do I have a right to your home now? I mean, that's at the heart of this too, no? Yes. A lot of legal uncertainty was going to arise out of these amendments that have been passed, um, particularly the, the, the family amendment, the redefinition of the family. Uh, Michael McDowell, who is one, who's a senator and a former attorney general in Ireland, led uh, a no campaign that he formed a group of lawyers to oppose the amendment. And his, main, his, his argument was basically that we are sowing chaos in the constitution um, because, and in people's lives, because they will not know, people will not have any legal certainty about, for example, who is eligible to inherit their property. Um, so if you don't make a last will and testament and you die, um, who has a claim on your property could, for example, uh, my girlfriend, if I had a girlfriend, could she have a claim on my property that was on a par with the claim of my brothers and sisters or my parents? Um, and the honest answer is nobody knows. Nobody knows the answer to these questions because the legislators 
didn't actually give any answers to these questions. They didn't define it in the law. And so this would have gone through the courts and it would have been a nightmarish process where people would have had to fight all sorts of complicated cases of inheritance and tax law and pensions, um, many, many ramifications and immigration as well, because, um, of course, family reunification rules in immigration could have been fought on the basis that uh, they were being excluded by the Constitution. Um, You know, for example, if someone had three wives, uh, you know, and he wanted to bring over his three or four wives, well, under this definition, surely he could, and their children, and all their children. And, and, and that would have to be fought out through the courts to see if, if they could. There would have been a lot of litigation, complicated litigation, and a lot of legal uncertainty. I mean, we know in probate court in the United States, I'm not sure exactly what it's called in Ireland, but oh my God, it's a nightmare. If you don't have a will and testament set up to make sure that your family, you're designating who in your family are going to be handed down certain items, then it goes to probate court if you don't have that. And a judge gets to decide, you know, a judge gets to decide the makeup of your family. They don't know you at all. This could just, and that, and it's already a nightmare. Probate court in the United States is already yeah. nightmarish. And now you add, you would add this incredibly complex layer on top of it would be just a disaster for people. I mean, you would have, not just for the family, it would be, a, you know, a real estate nightmare. It would be a tax nightmare. You, you drive your country, you drive your country into the toilet essentially by doing something like this. Um, mm. But this has all been done under the guise of like woke, woke progress, right? We're, we're being progressive here. Did the supporters of these members of, uh, members of the government did the constituents that hang out at the pub, that go to the soccer games, football games, on the weekends, um, go to the schools, were they demanding this? We need to rewrite the definition of a family? No, I don't think there was any popular demand. This didn't really arise out of... Um, I mean, the, I, I think they, there was a kind of a constitutional assembly that they have... Um, which is a sort of a not, uh, well, that's a whole other story, but they have a group of people who are taken out of a sample out of the population who debate constitutional issues and who apparently were consulted on this. I don't consider that to be reflective of the views of the wider population um, for lots of reasons, but but in terms of the, the, the wider population, um, no, there was no particular demand for these for these uh, referendums. And I think the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding because if you look at the actual results, um, the results are overwhelmingly negative. I mean, these referendums, uh, the turnout was 44, just over 44%, not a very high turnout, but not a terribly low turnout either. Um, And in the family amendment, which wanted to redefine uh, the the, the family, we had a 67.69% no vote. And in the care amendment, the care amendment, we had a 73.93% no vote. That's almost three, almost four and uh, three in every four people, three or four citizens voted no to the care amendment and two in over two and two in uh, three citizens voted uh, against the family amendment. Um, so if you just look at that, I mean, the care amendment was the, was the strongest no vote in the history of the constitution, in fact. Um, and then you look at, what the deputies in the parliament were voting. Um, And all of the political parties, except for two tiny parties, all of the parties were supporting a yes vote. And so uh, basically, the way I see it, basically between uh, 67 and 75% of the country was being represented by four members of parliament, four members of parliament in a parliament of 160. So uh, that tells me that we have a major crisis of democracy uh, because the, the, the disproportion is so enormous. I mean, I mean, so I think we also have a political opportunity um, because clearly this vote was also uh, a kind of a protest against the government. It was a vote of no confidence in the government because, frankly, people don't trust the government anymore. Um, a lot of people don't trust the government. And... I think, given that we have a general election just around the corner, between now and March of next year, we will have a general election. Um, I think this may uh, augur um, a significant realignment in the political system in Ireland. 
One can only hope, and I think we're seeing it in parts of Europe. I mentioned Portugal off the top here. Um, we're seeing it in other countries right now. And I think when put to a vote, people are saying enough is enough of this craziness. And I think people are shocked. Even in California, proposals just passed where, and the people there were shocked that they could actually get proposals through that would require background checks and make sure that no one's on drugs in order to get welfare. Um, and so the people were like, wait a minute, we can actually vote for this? And it passed. And now they'll have to be forced to check for those types of things. Um, and so I think you're starting to see a change here. Are you hopeful that Ireland will get its act together over the next year? Um, yes, I'm, I'm, let's say I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, I would say that one thing that's very clear is that the current political establishment of Ireland have to go. They are not competent to, to govern the country. They're the most incompetent government on issues such as immigration, housing and health care that I have seen in my lifetime. And, um, and I would say that uh, this vote is a significant political defeat for them, given that they were pushing these referendums, these amendments, uh, you know, publicly, and all the parties, including the opposition parties, except, as I said, these tiny parties were pushing for a yes vote. So um, I think what this depends on, I mean, getting, getting them out and getting someone better in, basically what it really depends on is the, uh, th th that there be some form of rival political organization that gets its act together and unifies. Because right now we have a bunch of independents who are not party, party affiliated, right? Who I think are sensible um, and then we have tiny parties who I believe are also quite sensible. Um, but if they could unite forces, because right now there is no rival political party or political party capable of rivaling the mainstream parties. Um, but there is a sizable bulk of independence and these tiny parties that if they, if they were able to unite, then that could help uh, you know, produce some momentum. Hmm. Well, one can only hope. Well, David, you've been doing a great job and hopefully... You know, people are waking up and paying attention to the work you're doing and covering this. And the Irish people voted overwhelmingly no on this. So we know where they stand on these issues. So hopefully this is a wake up call for the government. Uh, David Thunder, thank you so much. We'll have it linked up in the show description, your Substack, so people can check out all of your great work over there. We appreciate it as always. Thank you. I really hope you enjoyed watching this video. You know, YouTube thinks that you'll actually like this next video right here. It's personalized based on your own viewing habits. So if you watch the video, please leave a comment. Let us know what you think about it. And we will see you next time, everyone.